In the early hours of Sunday, May 12, 1996, a woman was picked up on the side of the road. She was conscious, but essentially catatonic, not acknowledging deputies Anthony Cardin or Sean Page as they attempted to ascertain her safety, her identity, and what exactly she was doing walking down the side of a dark highway in rural Kansas State at almost 3 a.m. The woman allowed the officers to guide her into the backseat of their cruiser and didn't put up any kind of struggle as she was taken to the sheriff's substation. At the substation, she was given a cursory examination and was found to be free of any physical injury, but her demeanor suggested to the officers that she had been rendered to such a state due to some unknown trauma. She carried no identification, and fingerprinting turned up no immediate results. While the deputies figured out their next step, the woman sat in an interrogation room, practically comatose, staring blankly forward, her eyes as unmoving as her body. What followed was a series of events that continues to baffle investigators to this day. At 3.43 a.m., the woman showed the first signs of cognizance she had since being picked up. In a subsequent report, Deputy Cardin described the woman's behavior. She suddenly looked more aware. When we picked her up, she was completely out of it, eyes staring dead on. But when her lights turned on, she stood up, didn't seem bothered by the fact that she was in an interrogation room or a police station. She sort of glanced over to the corner of the room and then winced, put her hands over her ears, and then she let out a scream like nothing I've ever heard before. Brought her to her knees, like the loudest sound you'd ever heard was hitting her. Of course, we didn't hear nothing. In the midst of the woman's fit of screams, she said four intelligible words. It knows I left. Deputy Page spoke of their presumptions based on the woman's peculiar behavior. We thought there was a good chance that she might be having a mental health episode, a pretty severe one. But I can tell you, outside looking in, I thought it looked pretty obviously to be drugs. I would have thought that. I did think that. Until the screaming stopped. I've never seen someone turn on a dime so fast. If she was on drugs... They wore off in about a half second flat. I've never seen anything like it. Once the woman's panicked episode stopped, she was inexplicably conscious. She no longer exhibited any signs of intoxication, nor the symptoms of a psychological episode, though of course, neither of those could be ruled out, and certainly not so hastily. The woman's whole demeanor had changed, and now she exhibited only one emotion. Fear. And though she was, as deputies would later relate, in a state of pure terror, she was lucid enough to provide the sheriff's deputies with at least a few answers to their many questions. The first bit of information the deputies gathered would later prove to be a bombshell. The woman was Amy Patricia Madden, who had been missing from her home state of Washington since 1989. During her conversations with Cardin and Page that night, Madden would make no mention of her status as a missing person. The story that Amy Madden provided to deputies painted a strange picture. She claimed that she had fled her home in a town she referred to as Humming Hills. When Cardin and Page inquired as to whether or not that town was in Kansas, Amy said it was not, and when asked which state it was in, she made a bizarre claim. It depends, and would not elucidate any further. According to Deputy Page, the whole mood of the room changed when Anthony asked her why she fled her home. She got real quiet and then looked up at us and said, Because he will be there soon, and no one else sees how dangerous he is. The deputies inquired as to who he was, but she gave another vague, though no less unsettling answer. She leaned in real close, said it so quiet we could barely hear her. She said, We shouldn't talk about him anymore. He can hear us, and he won't like it. 
Cardin and Paige attempted to learn more about her. They attempted to clarify her answer as to where this town of Humming Hills was located and learned nothing. They attempted to clarify her answer as to who he was and learned nothing. And when they asked her about family or others who might have reported her missing, her answer was similarly cryptic. According to Deputy Cardin, she said that no one would have reported her missing because they all knew she wouldn't be able to get away. She just said that she had to try. It was more than a little frustrating, her giving us the runaround. It got to the point that we started thinking our first instincts were right, that she was on drugs or having a bipolar episode or something. She seemed real paranoid, and the way she talked, I would have sworn the things she thought were hunting her down were all in her head. Deputy Page continued. She broke down in tears. She didn't... She was inconsolable. She kept saying she made a mistake by leaving, that there was no point, that she was going to end up back there no matter what. We were at a loss. We got her some water, got a little food into her. She didn't eat much. But after she had that little breakdown there, she seemed very calm. And, you know, I look back at it, and now it seems like she had just kind of accepted whatever outcome she thought she was headed for. At 5.51 a.m., Amy Patricia Madden asked the deputies to use the restroom. Deputy Cardin escorted the woman to the restroom at her request. She, in fact, asked Deputy Cardin to accompany her into the restroom, her reason being that, quote, if he came for her, Cardin would know she wasn't crazy. Nevertheless, the sheriff's deputy assured her that no one would be coming for her, that she was in the safest place she could be, and that he would be standing at the door to make sure no one entered the restroom while she occupied it. His staying in close proximity was also a means to ensure that he was close enough to stop any attempts this strange woman might make to harm herself. Cardin later said, I know it's probably hindsight, but the last thing she said to me, I would swear there was a look in her eyes. She knew. She knew what was going to happen. The last known words spoken by Amy Patricia Madden served as a chilling hint at the answers those curious are likely to never receive. You couldn't stop him if you wanted to. Moments after she entered the restroom, an inexplicable sequence of events unfolded over the course of 20 seconds that have left people wondering for the past 27 years. According to Deputy Page, I was filling out paperwork at my desk. Anthony was with the young lady, and all of a sudden there was a sound like the AC unit had just powered up. This low, kind of vibration sound, and it just went on and on, getting louder. It seemed slow at first, gradual, but before I knew what was happening, it was deafening. Deputy Cardin continued. It was like someone humming into the world's biggest microphone. I thought my eardrums were going to burst. This sound, which has been confirmed by both deputies as well as several other individuals present at the substation at the time, lasted for approximately 15 seconds. The interior of the substation took extensive damage. The magnitude of the droning, which is estimated by some to have reached upwards of 200 decibels, shattered glass throughout the building and cracked the foundation on which it stood. Only seconds after the sonic assault began, Deputy Cardin announced himself and entered the restroom to ensure the safety of Amy Madden. He found the restroom empty. He would go on to explain, There was nowhere she could have gone. There's no windows, and any vents she might have thought to use. Uh, there was just no way she could have gained access to them in that short a time frame, much less screwed them back in once she was inside. She just vanished. When the humming stopped, an extensive search was undertaken to locate Madden, a search that was ultimately unsuccessful. The final reports on the strange occurrence raised a number of questions that, as mentioned, will likely never be answered. The damage to the sheriff's substation led investigators to declare that it had fallen victim to some manner of earthquake, officially labeled as a, quote, unidentified seismic event. Despite the insistence from all present that what they had endured 
was nothing of the sort. More curious yet was that while the noise was loud enough to damage the foundation on which the station stood, no one present was subject to any hearing damage or loss, either temporary nor permanent. Deputy Page said, In the moment, it felt like my brain was going to burst. It just kept getting louder and louder and louder. I couldn't even hear myself screaming. And I'm not ashamed to say that I was. I was screaming at the top of my lungs. I thought we were all about to die. But when it stopped, that was it. As far as hearing and sound went, it all went right back to how it had been ten seconds before, or however long it lasted. And perhaps the most chilling detail of this strange occurrence? Of the ten people present at the time of whatever happened, only two remain alive and or accounted for today. Alan Jones, the substation's custodian, was the first instance. He failed to show up for his shift on July 9th, 1996, and was never seen again, with no motive nor means for leaving, as his vehicle was still parked in his driveway and no other form of transportation had been utilized, at least as far as investigators could discern. Deputy Sean Page one of the two officers that picked up Amy Madden on the side of the road, took his own life on October 30th, 1999. Christopher Ryan, Annette Poole, Matthew Kozlowski, and Jim Alborn, all sheriff's deputies who on that tragic morning were either returning from the previous night's shift or preparing for their upcoming shift, took their own lives between 2002 and 2009. Three of the four complained of various hearing-related irritants in the days leading up to their deaths. Captain David Earl Snyder disappeared after leaving the station on December 27, 2010. His car was found abandoned on the side of the road six miles from the station, his footsteps leading into the adjacent woods. And perhaps the strangest instance, Judy Little. An officer working the front desk of the station left her home on the morning of January 9th, 2013, after saying goodbye to her husband and son. She had left home at roughly 7.15 a.m. Her body was found in upstate New York at 9.53 a.m. of the same day, exhibiting signs of advanced decomposition. Accounting for the change in time zone, Judy Little was only gone for roughly 40 minutes. Travis Dunn, a man who had been arrested on charges of driving under the influence and was asleep in a cell at the time of the incident, saw his mental health rapidly deteriorate and has been in a psychiatric institution since March 2, 1997. Similarly, Deputy Anthony Cardin, the other officer who picked up Amy Madden that night, fell into a sudden state of catatonia, his last day of lucidity being June 8th, 2011. He is currently cared for by his two daughters. Research and investigation into the supposed town of Humming Hills has persisted for the last nearly three decades, with the occasional mention of it coming up in the course of other, unrelated official investigations spanning five states. But still, no conclusive evidence to the alleged town's existence has ever been uncovered and no trace of Amy Patricia Madden has ever been found.